my name is Greg Trainer. I'm here in Eden Derry at the Town Hall. We're doing a documentary to tell the story of a famous night way back in 1945 when the O'Connell family lived in this Georgian building with their mother and their little dog. But anyway, over to my good friend Dr. Kieran O'Reilly, a local Eden Derry man and a wonderful historian, to give you a little bit of history about this building itself. Hello, my name is Kieran Riley, a historian. I'm here on Blundell Hill, uh, overlooking the town of Eden Derry, from which uh, the town derives its name, Edondera, meaning the Hill of the Brow of Oaks. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this uh, documentary, which records a, a very historic moment in the history of the town uh, when the town hall went on fire. Um, of course, the O'Connell family resident in the house on that night. It's a town hall, the building itself, um, built between 1826 and 1830, uh, designed by the famous architect Thomas Duff. It cost £5,000 and was officially opened in 1830. At the time it was opened, uh, Thomas Murray, who was the land agent uh, here in Eden Derry for the Downshire family, he refused entry to the town hall for the local people in case they would uh, damage the walls um, or, or, or damage the house in, in any way. It was known as the market house because um, on the ground floor um, it contained space for a grain market which was held on a, on a weekly basis. Over the course of the 19th century then, uh, a cattle and sheep market developed, held once monthly. The town hall also had a, a museum and a library. Thomas Murray established a library in the 1840s um, and his son Thomas Richard Murray established a museum with artefacts which were found all around Eden Derry during the years of the Great Famine. Uh, people were put to work on drainage and relief schemes and items that were found formed part of the museum. So the town hall would have been somewhere where people came from, from all over Ireland and indeed from the UK to see this famous collection that Thomas Richard Murray put together. It was eventually sold by him the year before his death to Cambridge University uh, where it remains today and it was sold uh, to Cambridge because of the connection there with Professor Ridgway who worked in Cambridge who of course was connected to the Colonel Ridgway who apprehended Cairns and Perry so lots of connections there uh, with that. The Downshire family owned 14,000 acres of land around Eden Derry. Uh, they were one of the largest landowning families in the country. Um, of course their main seat was at Hillsborough in County Down. They also owned Blessington in County Wicklow. Around 1905, they made the decision to sell their southern Irish properties um, under the terms of the Wyndham Land Act. And between 1905 and 1921, the tenants living here in Eden Derry, uh, bit by bit, uh, managed to buy back their holdings. And so by 1921, the Downshire Connection, which you know is 100 years this year, uh, almost uh, was almost concluded. The last remaining uh, bits that, that, that were left to, to conclude uh, were the, the, the turf bogs and banks uh, which surrounded the town of Eden Derry and this was a very contentious issue because people relied on them for their livelihoods and that remained uh, as a source of, of, of grievance for many years after as to who actually owned the turf banks. The other main issue was what would happen to the town hall and uh, it was something that concerned the town commissioners throughout the 1920s and, and the big thing was that it wouldn't fall into private hands uh, you know, turned into a, a residence or flattened uh, and, and, and something else put in its place. Thankfully in 1929 the Eden Derry Town Commissioners purchased the Town Hall for £500 and that coincides with the arrival of the O'Connell family as resident caretakers uh, in the Town Hall in the 1930s. Another interesting side to the O'Connell family is their connection to the historic events that surrounded the executions of two Wexford men, Colonel Perry and Father Cairns, who were on the run from the yeomen, but were apprehended in Clunbelog and hung, drawn and quartered in Blundellwood during the 1798 Rising. It is alleged that a Mrs Kate O'Connell, the local nurse and midwife from New Row, what is now called Francis Street, took the remains of the priest on a bog barra to her home and stitched his head onto his body. The remains of these two heroic men were laid to rest in the O'Connell plot in Monastorus graveyard. It is said that the fine Celtic cross that stands over the two legends was dragged from Wexford in the quiet of the night to avoid being caught by the authorities by horsemen around 1877 and erected over the two men. It's still there to be seen, standing proud in the O'Connell plot, Monastorus graveyard, Edenderry. 
One of the features of the town hall and the building of the town hall was that it could be seen from the upstairs uh, rooms in Blundell House, which was the agent's house less than 100 yards away. Uh, and this was to ensure that on market day, the agent could keep a close watch on the proceedings of the markets. In 1881, when the land war kicked off, uh, the local people were becoming aggrieved to having to pay an entry to the market uh, when they came to sell their goods. Um, and on one day in, in November 1881, a local man called William Kalali decided to defy uh, the bailiffs on char in charge of the, of the local market. And he just walked past, um, and there's a local saying uh, which has been handed down ever since, one at a time, said Kalali with the ass. And that refers to the fact that the local land league purchased a donkey for William Kalali uh, in the aftermath of the incident uh, for his bravery. And from that day forward, the downshirts, from 1881 onwards, the downshirts were unable to collect uh, a rent or a toll on, on the weekly market. And the people uh, went to and from the market and, and done their business uh, without interference from the downshire family. Well, thank you so much, Kieran, for that very interesting piece of history about this lovely building in the town hall in Eden Derry, how much it cost and who built it and so on. But the main story we're telling in this documentary is about the O'Connell family who were born and reared in this huge building, along with their mother and their little dog. Now there were seven O'Connells, four boys and three girls. They had just lost their father in uh, 1943. The hall went on fire in 1945 and they were living here and being reared by their widowed mother. On the night of the fire, their little dog was locked away by the local sergeant for chasing bikes and for being a bold little boy. But he got out and escaped on the night of the fire and raised the alarm and saved the O'Connells. Now the ironic part of this story is, and this is not a yarn, this is true. The O'Connell's little dog, his name was Smokey. Now, come with me on this historic little trip down memory lane. I'm going downtown here to the harbour to meet up with some of the O'Connell family and they'll tell you more of that famous night and that famous story about Smokey and the O'Connell's and the town hall in Edenderry, County Offaly. Well, hello from the Grand Canal Harbour here in Eden Derry County, Offaly. I'm with two of the O'Connells, with Noel and with Eamon, and I've come to talk to them about that famous night in 1945 when the town hall went on fire. And uh, today we're going to go back up to the square in Eden Derry, Noel and Eamon, to your birthplace. And how do you feel about that? That'll be sad, but yeah, sure. if it has to be done, yeah. it has to be done. Yeah, well, the story has to be told. Mm, yeah, again. yeah. I suppose so. Like it was a massive part of her life, even though I was only eight when it happened. Yeah. But still, it was a huge thing yeah. in our life. Just to remind the people of a Manny, uh, where Manny was in the front. There's seven, four boys and three girls. Four boys, yeah. three girls. My ma, who was a widow woman. Yeah. My father had died. Your father had just died a year, eighteen months before. Though. Yes. Yeah. They named the whole family for me, Noel or Emma. Between you, named them from. Oldest to youngest? Well, Sean, Noel, me, yeah. Mixo, Eamon, the four lads, then the three girls. The three girls' names were? Marie, uh, Sis, Marie, and Telsa. Yeah. Theresa, Telsa, which never would buy right, yeah. Seven, Seven young kids. Yeah. All yeah. under the age of 12 and a half on the night that. I, I was 12, five. Sean was 13. 13 or 13. Eamon was, the what, was eight or nine. Yeah. God, it, it, it's surprising that it hasn't been documented before. But today, um, I'm going to take you both back up to the room in the town hall where you were born and where you were on that night, late January 1945. Are you ready? Yep. Well, let's go Why to not? the square and eat there. Okay. Are you driving? Let's do it. Are you driving or walking? Um, I'll have to drive because. Uh, Due to my bad hurling, I'm crippled. <laughs> <laughs> and Eamon, you were a man on the bike. Yeah, but I've had two knee replacements. Oh, gee, lads, we better go quick. <laughs> See you in the town hall. How does it feel to be back home, lads? Sad. 
Sad because the people that we loved, a lot of them were gone. And the poor old dog that saved our lives is gone, naturally. And so on. But it's nice that we're still about to tell the story. And it's a great story. What about you, Eamon? Well, it's quite paradoxical that we are sitting here in the room where we were born. Yeah. And if you go back and think of the age of this building, that we lived in it as a family, and then there was a disastrous fire which destroyed a very, very beautiful Georgia building. Mm. And it was, it was, it was a, an outstanding building all its life, mm. which ended in 1945. What sort of a layout was the, your um, living quarters? Can you describe how many rooms was it? There were seven of you, your mother and father, and then the seven siblings, four boys and three girls. Can you just give us the layout of where you actually lived within this big, huge building? Well, you walked in straight off the street into the living room, which was a living room, kitchen, everything. I thought it was on we the ground floor. Ground floor. Then above this was this room, which was my parents' bedroom. Then above this again was another, I would say, that came afterwards because that big window there was common to this room and the room above that we slept in. And of course that's gone now with the yeah. development of the town hall. So it was, it was a roof overhead, but fairly basic kind of yeah. living, but it was. Seven kids, four boys, three girls. How was your sleeping layout laid out? Well, the four lads slept up in the top room. And by the same token, in the Second World War, my father and mother switched rooms with us in case a bomb would hit and that we had some chance of escape. Right. And the switch rooms was, yeah, that was my father and mother. And the four lads slept together? Four lads slept together. So it must have been a big bed. There was a great big bed that my father at some stage had replaced. There was no spring in it, it was just boards. And he had boarded it and it was a matter of sitting on top of the board. Good for your back. And the, Yeah, well, yeah, I suppose it would. And the four and, of us slept in that bed. And the three girls slept? They slept in to one side of the room in another bed. So at one stage there were seven of us sleeping in one room. And then your mother and father had their own room. Yes, which mm. is where we are now. Plus your kitchen come yeah. sit down, living room, down, living room. It was down below down the, again. Down at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. it was down yeah. below again. Yeah. So really it was, the room above was, uh, had come at a later stage, you know, and just been added on. Yeah. That's where we were. At any, at any stage, because every time I see pictures of the market house, here, there was a big clock on top of it, a clock tower on it. Did it ever, was there ever a ring out of it or anything? Or, you know, a notification it was six o'clock or five o'clock or half five? I can't remember. You know, Greg, I was going to mention that. The night we all got out of the town hall, we were all standing over at McGuinness's. And somebody said, it's gone, it's gone. And we all looked as the whole top went down. Clock, the whole lot, just dropped into the centre of the building. That was the last of the town hall. But I think that was a big, that was a big steel or a big brass. Yeah. So it would have been a bit of weight. Oh yeah, of oh, course. Yeah, it was a huge, like, yeah, it was a huge yeah. big, yeah. big cupola, yeah. I suppose you could call it. Was the whole town out looking at the fire and he standing over out in the square? Well, there was a good, good lot of people around that. Don't forget, it started at six o'clock in the morning, and it had snowed the night before. Yeah. So it was very cold. I remember grabbing something off a coat hook as I ran down because I'd only a little vest on me, and running across in my bare feet in the snow to the snow. across the road. And when the local fire brigade come to put out the fire, disaster happened as well because of the frost. Isn't that right? Because all the pipes were frozen. All the water was frozen, exactly. And Pat Larkin, who we're speaking to in this documentary as well, 
he said that don't forget on the night of the fire the canal would have been the nearest source of, of plenty of water but that was frozen over as well yeah. exactly yeah eventually i believe the fire brigade arrived from the army from the corps an army fire brigade i think what could could it do with no water well it would have had a certain amount i suppose but like it was beyond saving you can imagine yeah how much time had elapsed from when we were and lads, uh, Greg, you could say the elements were against us. Yeah. <laughs> Big well, time. time of the year. Big end time. End of January. Yeah, yeah. Um, what everybody will want to know um, in the course of this documentary will be, um, what about the dog? Well, the dog, I suppose, in effect, should probably be the centre of the story because being a bit generous, he probably is the reason we're all we're still here. Why was he called Smokey in the first place? No idea, but that was his name when we got him. Not to do. It was only coincidental that he involved. He was later on involved in something that consisted of a lot of smoke. Where did he start his alert on that night? Where did he start? He actually uh, wasn't he our dog. dog. He wasn't your dog. No, no he inherited him. He was Dick Davies' dog. Matty, Dick and all the Davies dog. But if a lion came in and my mother was in the room and she said, lie down you, and the lion would <laughs> lie down. Would have been down. A and the lion immediately, or the dog immediately, Smokey immediately took him, your mother, and that was it. And I remember Dick saying, I'll let him there, he's all right. So you inherited Smokey. Yeah. <laughs> it was a nice inheritance because as Eamon said, he was very badly here, treated. Yeah. He'd been very badly treated, and someone told me that he'd been. They used to tie him up and beat him. If you put your hand out in front of me to go for you, and I got two very bad bites from him. Both times were when I came running through a door, and he was inside, and died, jumped up straight away with the excitement of me flying past him. Uh, and, yeah. yeah, but on the night of the fire, who did he alert first? Our mother. He went to your mother's door first. He was down below in the kitchen where he slept. And my mother was on the next floor, which is here where we are now. And he, instead of going to the front door and scratching to get out. So I've always remembered that. He actually went back and up the stairs to, to my mother's room, where my mother was. And to this day, can you See? remember him yelping and barking on that on no, the not a thing. historic night? No. You were all fast asleep. No, and my mother came running up to get out quick to place. And fire. apart from that, we were up at the very top. That's right, it was a three yeah. story it was a three story building at the time. Yeah. No, she walks up and said, get out as quick as you can to place it on fire. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've always thought of that, because the dog was down below and didn't go a scratching at the front door to get out on the street. He actually came back up the stairs mm. to my mother. So now yeah. she was the only person that he that he Loved them. She was the only one that could control he had, him. She had affection for him, and yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's a, that's a fair point. Like he didn't try to get out. No, he, he went didn't back go in to, at the front to, door. To, I've always remembered that. To raise the alarm, that he actually came up the stairs and scratched. I know there was dogged to make a run for it. Well, they'd be going to the front <laughs> door, going mad down below and scratching. They wanted to get out the door to get out of the street. So and was the building full of smoke, or was there any flame at that stage? There was very, yeah, there was smoke. I remember uh, burning my throat a little that bit as I came down the stairs. Yeah. I grabbed some kind of a little dressing gown or something off. There was coat hooks on the stairs. And apart from that, all I had was just a little vest on me. Right. And ran across in my bare feet yeah. into McGuinness's. Back to the dog again. Smokey had escaped from a policeman. He had escaped. Sm he got Smokey out. was a bad dog, a bad, vicious dog, and he got into the habit of attacking people on bikes. And he would chase the bike, try and snap at the person, not always getting them. But this time he got a bad bite on a woman, a woman called Bess Cleary, I think her name was, or something, it doesn't matter. And yeah. gave her a bad bite and pulled her off bike. He so, didn't like bikes. No, he didn't like the movement. And yeah. so there was a court order like against him. Uh, the, uh, they got a court order against him and he was sentenced to be 
but he got out. And the barracks, uh, for people who, who don't know, the barracks at that stage was only about 100 yards from here, um, down on JKL Street. It's actually where um, Dr. Brian Emerson, who has been a great That's doctor right. in this town for many, many years. Well, That's since right. 1973, Dr. Brian Emerson has been in Eaton Derry. And it's, uh, was it his house that the, the barracks was? He was? Yes, and he was locked. The dog was um, imprisoned in a shed out the back. Yeah. And um, well, he actually, <laughs> he was awaiting execution. Yeah, he was on death row. <laughs> yeah. And he dug his way out under the foundations of the shed, which probably wasn't too hard to do, and came back straight up to my mother. And the police didn't rush back, or the guards didn't rush back to get captured the next day. It drifted on a bit. Yeah. And I don't remember how the time that elapsed, but say it was seven or eight days, and they still hadn't come to re Still hadn't come together. And then the fire happened. Yeah. And of course, then the subsequent thing was that he was reprieved. This is Marie O'Connell with the infamous Smokey. She sent us this lovely message from Luton in the UK. My name is Marie McClure, formerly O'Connell, and I'm one of the seven children rescued from the Town Hall fire in Edenderry in 1945. That rescue was made possible by the actions of our dog, Smokey. Smokey had attached himself to the family and had been known as a wicked dog who did not like people on bicycles and always chased them and tried to pull them off. And my mother adopted him and tamed him, but he couldn't give up his bicycle chasing habit and he pulled a lady off a bike right in front of the town hall. So the guardie decided that he had to go. On the night of the fire, he was actually locked up in the guard station awaiting execution. And he broke out, ran to the town hall and woke my mother up. And his actions were what saved the whole family. We've got um, a lovely picture here. and uh, It depicts um, a scene from the GPO in 1916. But this is one of the one of the only pieces that was saved from the fire here in the market house, which is in Nary Town Hall now, where we're sitting right now. And this hung in this room. Yep. The this kitchen. is this is the over a hundred years old at least. At least picture. But it hung in the kitchen wall. How did you get it out? It was one of the first things that whoever it was, and I can't remember, it certainly wasn't me, but it was one of the first things that was taken off the wall and out the door. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, it's in great shape. Now, I haven't said a few people did, a few men turned up and dragged a bit of furniture out. Yeah. Including my mother's piano. I have some wonderful memories of this beautiful building, from going to see Santa as a little boy, to being amazed watching stage productions by our local actors, called the Boyne Players. I've had the pleasure of gracing that same stage in hugely successful even their youth productions such as Grease and Godspell, moving on to play lead parts in Eden Dairy Musical Society's productions of My Fair Lady, The Mikado, Oklahoma, to mention a few. Ah, the magic of the town hall stage. I certainly will never forget. How are you getting on the ladder? Good. Great to see you. And it's great to be here after so many years. I'm a long time in business here now. I'm a my wife and I are over 50 years. You're over 50 years in business it's here, here on, JK, on JKS? JKS. And prior to that, you were right, in right. O'Connell Square? Uh, prior to that, I was in O'Connell Square. And I worked with my father there 13 years. That's where uh, the letter worked there. Yeah. And uh, then, you see, the family decided they were going to retire. So they retired on the side. Me. So that's, that's much the story. My father was in business in Eaton Derry. 60 years. 60 years. So, the, so now we're, we're talking about four generations of Pat Larkins. Now your father was Patrick Larkin. Mm. Pat Larkin, you were Pat Larkin. Your son is Patrick Larkin. And then his son is P. Larkin, P. Patrick Larkin as well. So four generations. Four, four generations. And there is people coming into the pub and saying, well, well, I'm after getting a pint now of support, if you know what I mean. Yes. If I got a, gave me a pint, if your father you gave them a pint. pint. My son gave me a pint. Now the next generation gives me a pint. In all fairness, looking up at the picture in 
the bar in there, a lot of people do ask, is that Pat now or is it his father? Yeah, that's it is, But it's yourself. It's me, it's yeah. It's yourself. Yeah. But your the image of some pictures of your father. Oh, yeah. And identity, and identity. But we're talking about the, the town hall, you, because you were born and reared right across from it that's right. as a very young chap. And the O'Connor family who were in it when it went on fire hmm. in late January 19. 1945, a shocking night. A long time ago, I know it. What's your recollection of that night? Well, I was only seven years old at the time. That's, that's the age I was. And the next thing, this fire erupted. And it was something, you know, that we never seen before. It was, it was unreal. So the fire took grip, and the next thing, a very short space of time, the whole place was up the roof. The next thing, the roof was gone and all like that. That was the fire. But the only thing that saved the Connells that night was their dog. Smokey. And, and the Connell smoke. The that's famous right. smoky. And that's, that's who saved them. But after the fire then, do you see, uh, what was going to happen to the Connells? Because uh, they, were young, young they were a young family and the husband was dead. He was only after dying in 1943, at 38 years of age. 38 years of age. A lovely man, a very yeah. gentle man. But yeah. anyway, uh, the, the, the night of the fire and all like that, was, it was a, a dark day in Eaton area, it's all like a day, a very dark day. But your mother and father took in some of the O'Connells yeah. after the fire? Yeah, my mother and father, they took in Sean O'Connell and Noel O'Connell and they, now, I can't tell you how long they stayed there, but they stayed there for some time. But your mother and father were very good to take uh, them yeah, in. Yeah, took them in and they were treated as well in the family. It was very safe. Fantastic. I was, can you remember the actual night that was in it? Was it a frosty night or something? Or a foggy night? It was night? very frosty night. Very frosty. Yeah. And even the road outside the town hall was just a mass, a mass of ice. Solid ice, that's what it was. And the, <coughs> see, they say they couldn't get water. They couldn't get water because uh, the canal was frozen, and that's where they would have been getting that's the water. Where the source of and, water would have been, and it was frozen solid. So much so that all the kids just make it down. Uh, Skating rink. And slides on it and yeah. everything. And it was, uh, and it, uh, there was no, there was, there was no sign of it. <laughs> have you any memories of the dog chasing bikes? Any memory of the dog chasing bikes? Smoking. No, but I heard that. I heard he. I heard he was. Yeah. He, he was a bold little boy. He, he was. He was. He was a bold little boy, as right. But yeah. he wouldn't hold that again. Him. He did. <laughs> he did. He, he did a good deed that night. Anyway. He did a good deed. He yeah. saved the O'Connells. Oh, good he did. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great. And you're keeping well. And you're in business here now since what, what year, Pat? Down here on J K Street. Sixty-nine. Nineteen sixty-nine. I moved in here, yeah. and I'm here ever since. Thank you. And you're looking as young as you ever did. <laughs> Stacia's <laughs> minding you well. No, she's minding me well, yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about thanks, that. Thanks, Pat, for taking part in this documentary. Um, you know, noting the time that you were a very young boy across from where probably the biggest building in Lincoln went on fire in January 1945. Yeah. Thanks, thanks again, big. Pat. Right. You're looking okay, great. Right. I thought you are a gentleman. Thank you. Well, it's a marvellous story, you know, and uh, the character who seems to be central to the whole story seems to be little smoky the dog but um, unfortunately there's a sort of a bit of a sad end to the story and maybe I mean, you can tell us what happened. Well what happened was Smokey who had been arrested for attacking people on bikes very quickly got back to his old bad habits and started pulling people off bikes again even though he had been reprieved from his original sentence but he became a bad dog again and really pulled a woman off a bike and she was seriously hurt and unfortunately there was another court order against him to be destroyed and he was. The Fed police eventually took him away and shot him. Poor Smokey. And that was the end of poor Smokey. Poor Smokey. And my mother couldn't do a thing about it. It was quite sad really because she actually got abusive letters from people all over Ireland allowing the dog to be shot. She had no hand actor power, she could do nothing about nothing it. Nothing she could do about it. No, it was a court order. <coughs> the, um, the Irish Times quoted, quote from the Irish Times 1945, Smokey 
from one day being the town's enemy to the next day being the town's hero. Smoky. Yeah, very apt. Was it, Greg? I didn't know that. That was the quote from there. Oh, my gosh. That's nice. Mm. That's nice. Fat in a way. Yeah. But there we are, we were all small, young. We, we, could we do never, nothing. as far as I can make out, it never affected any of us psychologically. Maybe it did. And we don't realise. <laughs> We're back down at ground level here in O'Connell Square in Edenderry outside the Market House and, uh, well, better known as Edenderry Town Hall. Just behind me on my right shoulder there was the, the entrance to the, where the O'Connell family used to go into their residence in the Market House back in 1945 and years prior to that. There were steps up to it and there was a big front door there and that's where they lived. That's where these guys were born and reared. That's where they were at the end of January when this wonderful building took fire. Uh, lads, having a look around here now, this was your playground back when you were a kid. Yep, absolutely. We played hurling and football here. There was faction fights when a crowd from the Tunnel Road used to come off armour blocks <laughs> and pelt us with stones. Well, look at that corner up there. Oh, yeah, well, you had a good vantage point here. You could see it. If you were in the top window up there, you could see a lot of things around the whole town hall. But uh, looking around here now, you wouldn't play much football and hurling here now with all the cars that are going. You would by. not. But, but all, all our friends were all around the whole square. Yeah. Moores, Larkins, McGuinnesses, you name them. Yeah. But well, there was no cars going around here at that time. No. no not at all. Horse and cars, ass and cars. <laughs> Noel, you were telling me at one stage that your brother Sean was knocked down with a horse and car. With a horse and car. Horse and car was, there was a fountain just between us and Larkins, and he was running across and got hit with the horse and car. He wasn't badly hurt, but right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was dangerous then. But a great playground he had, you know. A spacious one, anyway. Yeah. And you were saying, Eamon, that if you saw a car or a lorry going by, it nearly, Stand it was a novelty. It was a novelty. Yeah, yeah. Um, Getting back to your family, your brothers and sisters, uh, just to remind the people watching this documentary, so starting from the oldest, Sean, Sean, and uh, who died, sadly passed away ju ago. during the making of this documentary. Sadly, rest in peace, Sean. Next down I was next. Noel, Noel was next. Next you, up. You, you've lived in Edenderry most of your life, but you were in London. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. And then Mixer, Mixer, who is in London, in lives London. Lives in London. Yeah. And then Eamon. Eamon. Then Eamon, you lived in New Zealand for a good few years. Yeah, 20 years, and I lived in London for five years. That. Right, yeah. And I also spent a little, worked in Germany and China for a while. Right, but you're back So home all now. in all, I reckon I was out of Edenderry for between 28 and 30 years. Right, yeah. Then coming down in to your sisters. Place. Your sisters <coughs> then. The eldest of the sisters was... Well, well that's sis, and she ended up in New Zealand. Yeah, sadly passed away. Maybe. Sadly passed away. Died in New Zealand. Telza, who is in Canada. She's in Canada at the moment. Yeah. And uh, tells and Marie, her, who was Maybe in, say hello to Telza because surely this documentary will get to her at some yes. stage. And Marie. We're who thinking is about in, you, Telza. We're Marie not, we're not forgetting Luton, about you. In England. And Marie is in, in Luton. In Luton. And uh, Marie has sent, you've seen the piece earlier on that Marie sent us. During COVID times, we, unfortunately, we couldn't get over to Luton to, um, to film her, but she got uh, her son to film it a little bit. And that's the piece you saw earlier on from Marie. And. Um, Thanks very much for that, Marie. And that's the O'Connell family. And uh, the two lads have been back to the room where they were born and reared. A little bit of sadness in it, remembering the story of their little dog, Smokey. It's been a pleasure interviewing these O'Connell people and the O'Connell family and telling this wonderful piece of history that all happened right over our shoulders here at the end of January, 1945, the night Smoky saved the Alcalans. Thank you like very much. Say, thanks very much to Greg and John for all they've gone through setting up this lovely life story. Goodbye, everybody. Hope you enjoyed <laughs> the documentary. <laughs> Bye,